Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us this evening. And uh, we are delighted to share uh, with you some innovations in senior adult oncology treatment. Uh, I'm Martin Exterman. I'm uh, the uh, program leader for the Senior Adult Oncology Program. And uh, I will uh, introduce uh, the various speakers and the uh, topics. I have a few um, household items to do first. Uh, this is uh, just to tell you, this is not medical advice. This is uh, just an information webinar. Of course, if you have an emergency uh, during the call, which I hope you don't, call 911. Uh, and um, otherwise, uh, if you have any questions uh, during the webinar, uh, there is a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Please put your question in the uh, Q&A uh, box. You can do that throughout all the various talks. We'll take the questions at the end. The way we are going to do this webinar is uh, we are going to do three short talks at the beginning uh, with a broad spectrum to, to really allow you to see the, the, the breadth of what we do for these older cancer patients. And then uh, we want to have a, a, a good moment for discussion. So we reserve the whole half hour to be able to answer your questions and, and we really want that to be interactive. So please free to ask all these questions in our box and we'll try to tackle as many as we can uh, uh, in, in, about the, the topic. And feel free to be very broad in the type of questions you ask. Uh, and they don't necessarily have to be directed relate, directly related to our slides. So we'll uh, do three topics. One will be you know, more like the laboratory translational. And it's, it's what do we study aging and cancer? Why is it important to study aging and cancer? Then we'll look at some recent randomized trials about how we can improve the ability of patients to receive treatment. And then the third talk will be, well, we see all this digital stuff going around. What does it mean for our older uh, cancer patients? So these are our talks and I'm not going to prolong. I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Ana Gomez. Ana Gomez is a laboratory researcher at Marfit who focuses on aging and cancer. She's in the Department of Molecular Oncology and she's also the me member of our senior adult program. So Dr. Gomez, the microphone is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Exterman for uh, the very kind uh, introduction. So if I could have the next slide, please. So um, I would like to just give a brief overview of why it is important to study um, cancer in the context of aging. And so I thought that there is nothing like start at the very beginning uh, of, um, of what you think uh, a tumor and cancer is. So generally speaking, and for very many years, uh, even for us researchers, uh, when we thought about a tumor, what we thought about was a mass of cells that grow um, um, uncontrollably. And uh, what that essentially means is if we uh, can just excise the tumor mass, then we should be all good, right? But uh, what we have learned uh, over many, many years of research is that this is um, just a small portion of what having cancer in a biological uh, sense actually means. Uh, next slide. So we now know that a tumor is not just cancer cells that control undivided. In fact, a tumor mass is comprised of very many different cells uh, that exist in our body uh, that, um, that are part of all our organs. And so a tumor really is a lot more than just simply the cancer cells. Uh, next slide. And of course, tumors grow, if they are solid tumors, they grow in organs, right? So when we, we think about yeast, we also need to think that the environment that the, the tumor and cancer grows in 
makes a difference um, in uh, the progression and, and the prognosis of said tumor. For example, a tumor that grows in the lung is very, very different than a tumor that grows in the brain. And that is very important to have into consideration because that affects uh, treatments, it affects prognosis, it affects all sorts of things. But in addition to having to think of a tumor in the context of an organ, next slide, we uh, also know, right, just from our own physiology, that every organ is inside of our body. And uh, inside of our body, these organs communicate. And so uh, in addition to, think, uh, to thinking about a tumor as more than a mass of cells uh, and thinking about the, the uh, organ that the tumor grows, we also need to think about certain conditions that are happening in our body that will affect um, that will affect cancer. And uh, to make matters even more complicated, uh, our body is very, very complex. Uh, we have very many organs and they all uh, communicate through circulation. So a tumor in a given organ is actually exposed to uh, pretty much everything that happens in our body at once. And so why am I telling you all of these in the context of a, a webinar for senior adult oncology? Uh, please, next slide, please. Well, uh, I'm telling you all of these because when we put it into context, we really need to uh, have into consideration the biology of each patient. Um, and with that in mind, next slide. We know that cancer is actually a disease of old age. So in other, word, in other words, what this means is that the probability of getting cancer grows exponentially as, um, as one ages. And you can see that by looking at the red line that is in this graph, you can see that when you reach 50, 60, uh, six years old, the, the uh, amount of uh, cancer uh, grows exponentially. And not only that, but also the um, cancer associated mortality also grows considerably. So all uh, of this together means that um, means that aging is very, very important uh, to uh, take into consideration in a prognosis and treatment options uh, for patients. Uh, next slide. So why, if I'm telling you that aging is that important and, and the biology of the human body makes, um, makes a very big difference uh, in uh, the prognosis and treatment options, why haven't we studied the relationship of aging in cancer um, extensively? So I can tell you that um, there are, at least in my mind, two reasons as to why uh, we as a scientific community do not have a good grasp on how aging affects cancer. One being that aging is very complex, uh, as you uh, may imagine and may feel in your body even. As we grow old, um, every single cell in our body changes uh, and we can feel that uh, after a certain, a certain age, we start to ache, uh, our skin changes, our hair grows um, gray, everything kind of changes in our body, right? But um, we don't really fully understand how does that happen biologically? And cancer, as you also uh, may know, is a very complex disease in of itself. So layering these two very complex uh, processes onto each other was until recently um, um, not really done uh, and very hard to do because the technology that we had to study um, to study this type of, uh, of, the, of processes was not quite up to par. But now uh, with uh, all the technology that we have acquired in the past 10 years, we are in a prime position to actually understand the impact of aging uh, in uh, cancer and treatment paradigms. Moreover, uh, there has also been um, a little bit of what I call wrong assumptions. And that comes from the fact that for very many years, um, researchers in general always thought of aging um, and cancer as simply uh, accumulation of mutations and damage 
to ourselves that occurs from the simple fact that time passes. However, we know now that uh, mutations are very far from being the only, the, the only or main even reason as to why uh, certain uh, cancers progress more than others and, and certain patients respond to certain treatments uh, or not. So please go to the next slide. So what do we actually know? Um, because we do know a little bit. So we know uh, that aging plays a very important role in cancer, mainly from experiments done very many years ago with caloric restriction. And, um, and I'll go into that in just a second because I think that really drives visually the uh, idea that aging is very important uh, in cancer, and we need to study it uh, much more than we have thus far. But in addition to that, we also know that um, uh, our organs and the tissues change as we get old. Um, so we know that there is a host of changes that occur in every single organ, which then will also condition the types of cells that are within the tumor and therefore condition the tumor. In addition to that, I told you that all our organs um, communicate through the circulatory system, through our blood. And so uh, we also know that, uh, for example, simply, um, simply treating cancer cells with blood from uh, old people makes those cancer cells uh, much more aggressive. So clearly there is a role, uh, a very important role for um, the whole aged system that is our uh, human body in, um, in, in cancer. Next slide, please. And so here, I just really wanted to show you uh, one key experiment that uh, for me, uh, since I was a student, really made the point uh, of why it is so important for us to uh, dedicate our time to understand how aging affects uh, cancer. So uh, to your left, uh, we have some monkeys. So um, you can see that uh, the monkey more to your left uh, is a 27 year old monkey. Uh, and you can see that the monkey actually looks old. You can see that there is gray hair. Uh, there is some uh, changes in posture uh, and um, the monkey is losing a lot of hair, much like what happens when we um, uh, also get old. But then uh, you can see uh, to the right, um, a monkey that is exactly the same age, but that has been on caloric restriction for 20 years. And what caloric restriction means is that essentially uh, you reduce say um, 40 to 65% of all calories that one eats every day. And so when we look at these uh, uh, monkeys, you can see that a 27 year old monkey actually looks quite healthy. Uh, you can see that there is um, full fur. You can see that they don't have um, a weird posture. They look fairly healthy, right? And uh, similarly, uh, you can see in mice that caloric restriction actually extends uh, the amount of time that a mouse leaves. For example, you can see here in the red line, this is a very, um, a very um, stark increase in uh, lifespan. You see that it's almost doubled when uh, mice are not allowed to eat more than 35% uh, of the normal caloric intake. So uh, all in all, caloric restriction is uh, a very uh, powerful way of, um, of um, delaying the aging process. So what does this mean for a tumor? Next slide. So here uh, is an experiment that was done uh, again very many years ago where um, it, it, this was done in mice, where mice were fed normally, and that's just what ad libitum means, that's just normal amount of food. And then they were treated with a carcinogen that causes cancer. You can see that there is a very big um, tumor mass in the liver right at the center of the picture. But what happens when we do the exact same in mice that have been caloric restricted for uh, the majority of their lives? So what happens is that you actually don't have a tumor forming. 
uh, in this in these circumstances, you can see the levers look. Uh, first of all, they look much healthier. But when we um, treat these mice with carcinogens, they do not develop tumors. And I think this is a very important experiment because it really uh, shows that um, delaying aging and the biology of aging actually affects tumorogenesis well beyond the exposure, uh, exposure to uh, carcinogens. So next slide. And with that, I will uh, finish and I would like to leave you with a take home message that uh, context really matters uh, for cancer and for, for prognosis and, and therapies. And that cancers that develop in old people are inherently different diseases than cancers that develop in young people. And there is a very, very pressing need uh, for more basic research uh, to understand what these differences are so that we can come up with better uh, treatment paradigms for uh, elderly patients. Well, thank you, Dr. Gomez. That's a, a great talk, a great introduction, and I'm sure it gets everybody brain uh, uh, thinking here uh, <laughs> behind the screens. Uh, so, uh, brew your questions and don't forget to, to write them in the Q&A uh, box on the uh, screen. Our next speaker is Dr. Mohamed Al-Jumeli. Dr. Al-Jumeli is a member of the Senior Adult Oncology. He has a dual certification in both oncology and geriatrics. So he's a very uh, extensively uh, train, trained colleagues with expertise uh, that is very broad. And he's going to tell us some uh, evidence-based uh, treatment based on that geriatric uh, manager assessment and uh, of our older patients and how that helps us treat our patients. So Dr. Aljumeli. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Eximent, for the introduction. And thank you for everyone joining us for this lovely webinar. I'm very delighted to be here to talk about the importance of the geriatric assessment uh, it's not surprising for everyone that America is getting gray, grayer, which means that there are higher proportions of older adults in the community than it's used than maybe 20 or 40 years ago. Uh, additionally, the, the rate of cancer diagnosis is rising, and uh, more than one-third of the cancer diagnosis happen in older adults. But let's ask questions as a nation, are we are doing a good job in managing uh, cancer on older adults? Uh, next, please. The unfortunately is not. You can see that the higher rate of uh, cancer-related death is higher in older adults compared to younger population. And the question is why, next please, why we don't perform well? Uh, there are many reasons uh, for that, one of them related to the biology of the cancer. Uh, Dr. Gomez mentioned earlier that there is increased incidence of cancer diagnosis with aging. The other related to uh, individual characteristic in some of older adults, some of them have high comorbid diseases uh, or a poor functional status. But the other problems, maybe it's uh, there is systemic problems. Uh, one of the systemic problems is age bias. Next, please. Uh, there is misconceptions uh, that chronic age is equal to functional age, which actually is not. So you can see that uh, you have uh, two persons in the same age. One of them are very fit and the other are really frail. The other systemic problem is uh, reduced in the research recruitment of older adults. Next, please. So uh, for while most of our older adults utilize the FDA approved drug or uh, uh, cancer therapies, there are little or few or maybe low proportions of older adults really uh, recruited in these trials. And uh, next, please. I think the other also maybe issues that maybe you are asking the wrong questions to the older adult with cancer. Some studies show what matter most to uh, most uh, of older adults that is preserving their independency or maintain their quality of life rather than just only prolong their life. Next, please. So uh, what's kind of uh, the challenge that we are facing when managing uh, cancer in older adults? There is, you can run into risk, the either risk of over treatment, which means uh, 
cancer therapy toxicity or under a treatment and this situation can actually are compromising a cancer control. And why is that? Because as I mentioned that uh, older adults are not uh, white and black, they are shade of grays. Uh, one of them, as you said, that is really fit, the other are uh, frail. And for that reason, uh, next slide please, uh, they developed a specific clinical tools called comprehensive geriatric assessment. This tool ba basically kind of evaluate the people in a 360 type of, of, of manner, like looking to the whole picture of, of, of the patient rather than just focus on snapshot about the cancer diagnosis and management. So uh, you can think about it like evaluate how uh, older people are really old. So this, this tool uh, involving evaluation in different domains. Uh, one of these domains, like the functional status of the people, the physical performance, comorbidity, polypharmacy, cognitions, nutritional status, and uh, psychosocial status. And based on this evaluation, you can have some recommendation, intervention to improve uh, uh, the deficit in each domain. Uh, for example, if uh, people who have poor functional status, uh, you, they might help get benefit from intensive course of physical therapy and so on and so forth. And since it's developed in 1990, there, there are cumulative evidence uh, that uh, found that Im implementation integration of this geriatric assessment in uh, managing cancer of older adult help to predict toxicity and mortality it, it guides the decision for cancer uh, management and ultimately improve the outcome. And it, it's also interestingly uh, found that it's implementing that would foster the communication between the provider and the patient to reach a shared decision. But uh, until uh, 2020, with ironically, is the pandemic of our life, it's uh, the same year that we get what they call level one evidence supporting uh, the importance of implementation of geriatric assessment in managing older adult. Level one evidence is basically you have the golden standard tabs of study, which is a phase three randomized control trial, two groups, and look to the, the effect of the intervention. Next, please. Uh, the, one of the study that I want to talk about is called GAIN trial, and that's presented in the uh, you know, the American Society of Clinical Oncology and also published in JAMA Oncology. This, in this study, the, the investigator tried to uh, investigate and study the effect of uh, integration geriatric assessment in tertiary academic setting uh, like ours. So uh, this is study done in City of Hope and they have patient around 650. They included patients who are uh, 65 years and above who are starting new chemotherapy. They divided uh, the patients in two groups, uh, the group that uh, received the intervention with geriatric assessment with intervention, the control group received just the standard of care and they follow the patient for six months. Next. Uh, so, and they found interestingly enough, the result is the study is positive, which significantly reduced in the chemotherapy toxicity in the study group compared to the control group. Not only uh, that, but also they found that there is improved in the rate of completion of the treatment. And they also the rate of uh, completing the advanced directive document, which I found is a really important document because this reflects what the patient wishes and preferences. Next, please. So uh, as you know that mo uh, most of our older adults getting their care in community setting, uh, not in the tertiary or academic setting, and for that, we have other study also presented called GAP-70 and also published in Lancet Oncology. In this study, uh, it's in, conducted by investigator at the University of Rochester. It has the similar design to the study that done in the uh, GAIN, uh, but in this situation, the community oncologist would uh, receive uh, a recommendation from the geriatric oncology based on the geriatric assessment while the control group just received the uh, center of care. And also the fellow patient for six months. And similarly to the GAIN trial, we found that there is significant uh, reductions in the toxicity, chemotherapy toxicity. But also when they look to the rate of survival in six months, which means the rate of death in, 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 in two groups, 
they found it is similar. Uh, so they conclude based on this trial that implementation of geriatric assessment would help to reduce toxicity, which means that this is going to translate to improve the quality of the life of the patient. But at the same time, it would not compromise the efficacy of the cancer therapy. Uh, but uh, next, please. So this slide just show you the uh, recent level one evidence trial that supporting the importance of implementing geriatric assessment in different settings, including even the preoperative se setting when you have the patient who has a cancer and he is going to have surgery, implementation of geriatric assessment also is valuable here in this situation. Um, but what kind of, uh, unfortunately, the geriatric assessment is not universally implemented in, in most of the cancer center. And uh, the reason for that, you can hear from our colleague that it's a uh, lack of resources or trained personnel or time constraint. It's that mentioning that it's time consuming. Next, please. And for that reason, uh, here at Moffitt, Dr. Exerman developed a uh, easy implemented and uh, uh, less time consuming uh, geriatric assessment driven models to protect chemotherapy toxicity. It's called chemotherapy risk assessment scale for high age patient or other name is a crash that can be implemented without needing like a trained uh, you know, uh, staff except just the, the, the treating uh, oncologist. Next please. And as uh, we all know that we are kind of slowly but surely kind of uh, uh, shying away from chemotherapy towards what they call precision medicine, target therapy and immunotherapy. Uh, so for precision medicine, specifically target therapy, it's mean that you get uh, the tissue from the cancer of the patients and just examine it or looking for specific markers or genetic mutation, the genetic makeup of that cancer, and based on that, you tailor your treatments, uh, you know, by, by looking for certain medication that can go and block specific genes or proteins in that cancer. Imagine it like you are develop a specific silver bullet to, to specific to, to, to that cancer to slow the growth. Uh, th this now has become a standard of care in many of uh, cancer therapy. But until recently, we don't have kind of... Uh, many evidence that supporting uh, what's the toxicity, I hope can we manage the toxicity in, uh, of this therapy in all that I adopt. Next please, here uh, at Moffitt, uh, kind of we try to advance the field forward. Next please. So that we have a, a project uh, st uh, to study uh, to, uh, the value of these geriatric assessment driven models uh, to predict uh, toxicity of target therapy in all that I adopt. Next please. So what we go from here, I think now we have the strong evidence to support that geriatric assessment is really important in the, in the management of older adults with cancer. Uh, but uh, so what we need to do is to uh, increase the awareness and try to uh, adopt some, uh, some a policy that uh, to make geriatric assessment, geriatric oncology management is uh, universal in all cancer center to reach the dream that uh, you know, geriatric oncology management will consider the, the ultimate uh, personalized uh, care. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. I'll take questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aljumeli. Uh, indeed, uh, we uh, will have plenty of opportunities to tailor to the patient as well as to the cancer, and we can discuss that more in our question session. Uh, it's uh, it, it's a wide uh, open field with a lot of things uh, beginning to develop there. Uh, my, the third talk uh, will be given by me, and the question I will address is: Can geriatric oncology go digital? You hear in the in the news, in the media, things about big data, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning applications. I mean, how does that apply to our older patients with cancer? What, what makes sense? What does not? And so let me introduce you to uh, what uh, can be done uh, in that case. So the first thing that is already happening uh, behind the scenes, and you may not know, uh, patients who come to our clinic have a, a basic geriatric assessment. And uh, it is fully integrated in our Moffitt care. So this is 
are electronic medical records. And uh, we have a geriatric access uh, screening that shows just be it's between our laboratory and our radiology exam. So you can't miss it. OK, you, you go down your column and you see all our patients parameter. This particular patient needed some help for shopping and finances. And uh, you can see that the quality of life was eh, so so health so so. And they have some you know, uh, memory issues here. So uh, we suggest uh, management for our patients uh, to help them. So this is the kind of things, very simple, digital, uh, you know, electronic medical record that's happening. Next slide. Now, can we go one step further? Can we use, you know, all of our cell phones has, for example, an app that can count our steps. Okay, it's supposed to encourage you us to exercise, and uh, it works more or less. Uh, so, um, one of our colleagues, Dr. Uh, Soto in Mexico, decided to try to use that for his patients, his older patients, because in Mexico they don't have as many physicians as we have. They don't have as intense a follow up as we have, and so they wanted to see if using a phone app could help identify people who have side effects from their treatment. So they gave everybody an iPhone uh, with an app and uh, they simply, the app was following their steps and relaying that to uh, their um, oncology service. And if they were seeing a patient walking less, then they were calling the patients. And a lot of times these patients were beginning to have side effects and they could uh, intervene and prevent uh, further complications. So uh, the really the, the severe toxicity, there was a very good uh, detection. 87% uh, were detected simply using that very simple phone application that did not require the patients to be uh, savvy in anything. So I think in the future, we may uh, be able to leverage that and uh, use a simpler way of following our patients, maybe asking them to come a bit less to the hospital or being able to take the, the problems early so that we can prevent patients from ending up in the hospital and help them uh, uh, go with the side effects of the treatment. So here, there is a lot of room for development. It's also a jungle because there is a whole lot of applications out there and we'll have to select and learn how to uh, choose the ones that really work well. Next step. Now, how do we develop evidence to treat our older cancer patients? Well, typically we do studies. We, we do large randomized studies as we call them. So these are studies where we have two treatment uh, arms. One is patients treated with what is the standard treatment at that time. And the other half of the patient or the other third or whatever, uh, if we have three arms, are treated with experimental treatments. Uh, so it can be the standard treatment plus something, or it can be a totally different treatment. And we learn whether the new treatment option works better than the previous one. So this is what we consider our gold standard, the level one evidence that uh, Dr. Dumali was uh, speaking about. Uh, the problem is that uh, the older patients are underrepresented in these studies. And this is an example from breast studies. And we look at the patients 65 and older, and we compare their proportion to the proportion of older patients in the, in the general population. So you can see that at the time these studies were done, uh, the, the proportion of breast cancer patients were 65 plus is 45 to 50%. But the proportion that ended up in studies is, is only 15%. So there is a whole lot uh, of patients we miss. And we only subselect the more healthy patients, the one with the least health problem, the least medication, the least transportation issues. Uh, and, and, and so we have a somewhat biased uh, evidence that is based really on the more healthy subgroup of patients. And so the question uh, that uh, we have here, if you can have the next uh, slide. Next, please. The question that's really important here is, 
how can we generate evidence for these patients who don't go on study? Okay, for that, that 85% of patients who, who doesn't match the study entry criteria and uh, you know, that, that we need to treat, we need to treat them well. So how are we going to find evidence for these patients? Next slide. Well, one of the possibilities is to do remote consulting. Most patients are treated in the community, not treated in a Moffitt where we have a dedicated senior adult program. So the idea would be that they would have a, a, a little screening uh, with, with a screening tool uh, and uh, an oncology workup. And if they have a treatment decision to make and they have problems and the oncologist is wondering what's the best solution, they can consult the uh, oncogeriatric consultation team. What we do is we look in Moffitt Total Cancer Care. So you are all familiar with Moffitt and I suspect you may have heard about Total Cancer Care uh, previously. This is a big protocol and uh, we ask our new patients if they are uh, in agreeing to participate and that allows us to uh, if we have extra tissue from their biopsies and so on to do uh, uh, research and also to collect their clinical information and uh, to recontact them if necessary. So it's a very rich database. And we have actually uh, more than 600,000 patients in that database. So we have a lot of patients. And if an, a community oncologist uh, treats a patient with let's say 93 or old, the bladder cancer and heart problems. Well, there's no study for that, but we may have treated half a dozen or a dozen similar patients at Moffitt. So we can look in that database, we can make a report, we make it all anonymous, of course, for confidentiality. And then we send the expert report to the local oncologist and they can use that to treat the patient. So it's a great idea. Question, can we do it? Next slide. We did a pilot with another hospital on the east coast of Florida. And over one year, we accrued 31 patients. And uh, in that uh, consultation, we found that uh, we influenced treatment in 40% of patients and we modified it in 20% of patients. The outside oncologist considered it very useful and uh, that's maybe being polite, but uh, the key uh, for you, uh, understanding usefulness is in the beginning, they were not so sure if it would help. At the end, they were saying, oh, don't quite close the study. I have one more patient I would like you to give me something about. So that for me tells me, yes, it is useful. And the good news is with the Moffitt system that we have, we can give an answer within two or three days. So this is really a clinically useful time. So we are, uh, we did that pilot, we are uh, very uh, proud of it. And now we have submitted uh, grant uh, requests to do the large randomized studies with this to help our patients who do not have clinical trial results. Next. The other thing that we can do is use machine learning. Machine learning and artificial intelligence are basically computer techniques to analyze a very big set of data, you know, 6,000 patients with 1,000 data per patient, for example, uh, and, and extract information that we can use in research to refine and develop things. So right now we are having a pilot and it is, it is funded by the Moffitt Foundation. Actually, it's direct foundation money from our donors. And we look at prostate cancer, uh, early stage uh, prostate cancer in total cancer care. And then what the question we are trying to find is, fine, my older patients do have prostate cancer. They also have on average three other different diseases and they take on average between half a dozen and a dozen different medications for these diseases. How does all that influence the behavior of cancer and how does that influence treatment? And uh, we want to know, we want to discover things. And we can discover the influence in two directions. One is, well, 
some patients with some medications may actually do better. There are some data out there that metformin may improve the prognosis of cancer patients. Uh, are we going to find other things in our patients? And if it's better, that may be new therapeutic synergies that can be potentially leveraged and do research on that. Or on the other hand, we can have combination that makes things worse. And if these combinations make things worse, maybe we can modify. We can uh, avoid uh, deleterious combination of medications. We could uh, treat the other diseases better to, to allow a better outcome of the cancer. So this is a very top of the line machine learning uh, uh, research project that we have going right now. Next. So this is my conclusion. Uh, yes, I think geriatric oncology can go digital. There is a lot of opportunities. And even at 90 years old, like my cousin, you can learn to use a new computer. Uh, I'm going to conclude my talk here. And just before we go to a question and answer session, I want to introduce uh, Ron Market. Uh, Ron Market collaborates with us. Uh, he's from the Murphy Foundation, and in, uh, he wants uh, to uh, help us do our research. And I'll let Ron uh, say a few words to us. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dr. Ekstrman. For 35 years, Moffitt has been making an important difference in, in the fight against cancer. Um, in this evening's presentation, you, you've heard about how this track record of success is having really a profound and positive impact on Moffitt's patients. All of us here in the foundation appreciate your interest in the Senior Adult Oncology Program. If you're among the donors who have chosen to support the kind of research uh, that informs these treatments you've heard about this evening, thank you. Um, if you've considered either continuing your support of the Senior Adult Oncology Program or would like to learn about how you can play a part in developing future treatments, please contact me at the information on your screen. Again, thank you for your interest in Moffitt Cancer Center. Well, thank uh, Ron. Uh, I mean, my research uh, has definitely benefited over the years from several uh, uh, grants and funds from the foundation. So I'm deeply grateful uh, when you want to try tr something truly new, uh, that, that is a very precious source of money. Uh, and uh, so, so thank you very much for that. Now, uh, let's go for the question. So I'm going to ask all the panelists to come live here. Um, all right. Um, okay, so we have everybody. And um, so the first question that uh, I have here, and I think uh, the, the three of us can, can answer the question is, well, how does someone know if they qualify for the trials and are there costs to take part in, taking part in clinical trials? Um, Mohamed, you want to maybe get yeah, uh, That's a good question. I think uh, number th one, that when we're looking for uh, patients who's coming to our office that, uh, to consider treatment, I think number one, we have to look if there is any trial first on that. Because trial is really important in oncology in general and specifically in older adults for two reasons. First, uh, when you get in, into a trial, uh, especially phase three trials, that you're gonna get the center of care layer that's any, any uh, other patient without trial getting. And in the top of that, you get another layer, like, you know, just, which is the investigation, either medicine or intervention, which is, we know about the safety, but we, maybe we don't know about its efficacy. So a trial is important for, for cancer of care. And for older adults, it's gonna help to advance the knowledge uh, about how uh, is there is any difference when we do this specific treatment intervention older adult compared to young adult? So yeah, I think your your treating physicians would help to guide you on that to see if you are fit in your case for any specific trial. Right, and and uh, there are some some ways. Uh, in the Moffitt website has a list of all the trials that we do, and uh, you can look some basic information as to whether uh, you would fit that trial or not, or your, your oncologist also can do that. 
or you can also contact us. Uh, if you call the Moffitt 800 numbers, we can, we can look into that. Uh, the uh, final uh, definition of if you qualify for a trial is done by the clinical research coordinator. They, they go to a very detailed list because each trial is a bit different into which patients they accept or not. But you can always ask, okay? They ask the question, ask your physician, is there a trial for me? Because we are all busy and sometimes uh, we forget there is a trial for uh, a particular patient. I'm, I'm just as guilty of that as other people. Uh, sometimes we just have a busy clinic. So it, it helps also a lot if you ask the question because it makes us pause and say, okay, let me just look in my latest list. Oh, I had forgotten about trial XYZ. All right. Uh, so uh, this, is a, this is also, uh, please ask, are there costs? Uh, the costs of the study drugs is typically covered by the trial. The cost of extra labs for Dr. Gomez is uh, typically covered by the trial. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the, but it doesn't mean that you will have zero cost because anything that is your, what would be done anyway, that's any treatment that we give for your cancer, maybe uh, need a CAT scan and a visit uh, regularly, that's going to be built to your insurance. But the uh, study stuff is going to be paid by the study, typically. Usually in the informed consent, they are going to specify things. Uh, it shouldn't cost you more than what your normal treatment would, should, would, would do. Uh, then uh, I have a question for Dr. Uh, Gomez here. Uh, the, the animal data on caloric restriction uh, cut calories by 40%. Okay, that, that's a big cut. <laughs> and so uh, are there nutritionists you can work with uh, or is it feasible in human? Uh, are, are there any data there? <laughs> <laughs> so that that is actually the deal. So um, cutting calorie, calories for forty to sixty five percent is very very hard. It's it's a very hard thing to do, uh, especially when you are sick, right? Uh, so it's just inherently you don't want to eat that little uh, and will make you, it will have effects on your mood. It will have all sorts of effects, right? So uh, even though the, the research on caloric restriction is, um, it shows amazing results, it is very difficult to do. Uh, there are no clinical trials uh, presently on that per se, because it's an age uh, delaying strategy, which um, takes very many years to achieve. So it's not like today you can just, you got diagnosed with cancer, you can just go on caloric restriction and the effects that I've shown you will occur. And those are effects that occur throughout lifespan, right? But uh, there is a lot of research being conducted on different strategies that uh, one can take um, with regards to nutrition that actually have beneficial effects in cancer. One of those being, for example, intermittent fasting. And that is a much easier approach to take because that does not mean that you need to reduce 40 to 60% of your calories every day. It just means that you need to time um, when you eat uh, in a more regulate fa uh, regulated fashion. And that has uh, been shown in clinical trials to have benefits, at least in some types of cancer like breast cancer. Uh, with regards to what type of calories should one eat, uh, it is at least um, on research done at a basic level, it is becoming very evident that, um, that it's kind of a, a little bit of everything. Uh, so, you know, there are several different diets that focus on, oh, let's just eat fats and not eat sugars. Let's just eat proteins and not eat sugars and fats. All of those uh, actually don't have the same benefit as just eating all types of food in moderation. So the key is always in moderation. But uh, if, if, if that is something that uh, one wants to do, definitely consulting a nutritionist is important because um, there are a lot of things out there 
especially in the age of the internet, there is a lot of uh, misconcepts and misinformation that get propagated. So it is very important to consult a nutritionist that will be able to tailor this type of uh, interventions um, and uh, diets to uh, your own case. Yeah, and, and we have that as integrated part of our program actually here. And uh, let's directly from the diet, but there are some data out there that show that if you, if you lose uh, even as little as 5% of your weight, it might help uh, improve your outcomes of the cancer. And the third thing that works is exercise. A regular exercise doesn't need to be intense exercise, but it needs to be some, some regular exercise like five days a week of half an hour of walking or things like that. That also helps improve the prognosis. Most of the literature is in breast cancer because uh, uh, it's, it's a frequent disease and you treat it and then you have a long period before it comes back. So you can do a lot of things during that period without confounding. But that's, uh, yeah, there's definitely a potential for, for things. Uh, another question uh, is, uh, does the genetic assessment apply only to certain cancer or is it universally applicable? Uh, Mohamed, you want to take that one? Yeah, um, so the short answer is apply for all cancer because basically geriatric assessment is, is a tool to evaluate the patient, not the cancer. Uh, you know that uh, older adults like, are different from young adults because uh, you know the physiology are different. They have their other uh, you know, uh, issues that assess by the geriatric assessment. As I mentioned in my talk, it's basically uh, evaluate how older adults are really old. So you can have uh, people who are in 80s, but their physiological age is younger than that, maybe in 60s. So what you can have people who are in 50, but their physiological age is 80. So, so that's basically uh, the concept about doing geriatric assessment. Because think about it, if the... The, the, your patient is frail and you give them aggressive treatment that any, like any standard of care for young adult, adult, this is kind of you are doing recipe for disaster. Like you're gonna have complication, side effect, and then delay the treatment and the, you will not gonna control the cancer and also you affect the quality of life of that patient. And actually uh, in level one evidence, we have those trials just that show the importance of uh, you know, geriatric assessment, but also now we are kind of going to, to doing trials in each specific type of cancer by implementation, integration, geriatric assessment. Here at Moffitt and uh, senior adult program, we have two trials, one of them looking to integrations of geriatric assessment in patient diagnosed with uh, lung cancer. We have other trials looking for integration of geriatric assessment in patient who had developed uh, metastatic pancreatic cancer. And this is gonna be kind of the golden star then from now on. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, what, when, so our program has been doing these geriatric assessments for 25 years. But uh, now that we have you know, all these studies that uh, Dr. Um, Al mentioned, uh, we, we want to spread it throughout Mafid so that our goal is that every new patient at Moffitt who comes with 70 and, and all has that assessment so that they are not treated just based on their age, but they are treated for who they really are. Uh, they are in great shape, go ahead, give them all the treatment they deserve. If they have frailties or vulnerabilities, well, don't slam them down with your treatment, tailor the treatment to match the patient. And, and, and so we want to know that. Uh, we, and uh, we have a, a program being implemented about screening everybody in no matter where they arrive at Buffett. It's work in progress, but we want it and you can always ask. Uh, it's available to every program at Buffett. Uh, all right. Uh, I have one last question here on the chat. Uh, let me see. Yeah, yeah, that's. Oh, no, sorry, I have a couple more questions before we go to the last one. Uh, um, okay, so is there a uh, uh, next question on geriatric assessment, actually, is it necessary through, uh, to do the geriatric assessment every six to eight weeks? Uh, 
I suspect it's a patient who has had to do the repeat testing. <laughs> um, so uh, I would say uh, this is work in progress. We are trying to, uh, we know from the geriatric literature, you have to repeat it. Just doing it once is not going to inform what you do two years from now. And when we treat cancer, uh, the, the condition of our patients can change, uh, especially if they're on chemo, things may not be the same every two months. And, and we want to detect things early before they deteriorate. Uh, so we had to find a simple rule to try to test that. So we decided when we repeat a CAT scan, uh, we repeat an assessment. We assess the cancer, we assess the patient. So since we do CAT scan about every two months during the treatment, well, <laughs> it happens we do geriatric assessment every two months. Is this the right frequency? I don't know yet. Uh, we, we had to choose a, a way to do it in a simple fashion and systemic fashion in our clinic. We are collecting our data and then we'll see, you know, how fast to change and which patient should actually have it every two months, but which patient could only have it every six months for things like that. Uh, so uh, there, we are, there with us, thank you for helping us learn. Uh, and uh, we will, we will uh, progress. When we started our program, everybody had a full-blown geriatric assessment, two and a half hours worth. And then we learned that well, actually only half of our patients need a, a detailed assessment. Uh, so we, we designed the screening tool and now we know who needs what. And uh, we hope to do the same thing with our repeat assessments and know who needs it every two months, who needs it every six months. Um, do you want to add something, Mohamed? <laughs> no, actually that's a really help, uh, uh, great answer, great question also. I think, uh, Yes, there is no study showing that, but uh, as we talked about the domains, that domains can, can change during cancer therapy journey. So maybe that's why we adopt this uh, to repeat that. Maybe it depends, you know, once after three months, but I think it's, it's worth repeating that because uh, during cancer journey, like, you know, things can change in, in the patients. All right, there is another question here. Is, are you looking for longitudinal study participants over 65 and with or without a prior cancer diagnosis? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the Moffitt doesn't have a, a specific longitudinal study. These are usually very large studies that happen pretty much nationwide. There is one study uh, led by the American Cancer Society uh, which uh, I think they call it the, uh, uh, the million people study. And uh, it's a large epidemiologic study where they are going to collect data on the exercise people do, the, uh, how much they eat, they take some blood samples for their genetics and their metabolomics, and they are following them. Uh, and these are people who, who do not have cancer uh, I don't remember if there is an age limit. It's, it's like all, pay, all people coming in, uh, but this is a very large study that uh, also is using mobile applications and uh, that can provide a, a lot of information. There are existing longitudinal studies of aging uh, that have been going on for 20, 30 years sometimes. And these studies are very rich source of data. And at Moffitt, uh, we have uh, the person who was leading the Women Health Initiative study. And uh, that was, uh, so, so Dr. Tu Roger, uh, is uh, we have the ability to use this data from this very large study, uh, studies uh, to uh, learn about aging and cancer. And it's a very rich source of data. And some of them have biologic samples that we can use and uh, definitely uh, if we can grant grants or foundation money to do these things, uh, that's an opportunity to learn things about aging and cancer. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, there is another question here. Uh, so uh, I am concerned about the side effects of cognitive impairment of antiandrogen treatment for prostate cancer. Can you discuss this concern? 
uh, I'm 82 years old, my prostate cancer was treated with radiation. I have been on and off treatment for about four years, depending upon level of PSA recorded on an every three month follow-up. All right, so cognitive impairment with anti androgen treatment. Mohamed, do you want to take that yeah, one? Yeah, I, I think <laughs> this is, uh, was studied and there is some evidence, uh, you know, supporting that there will some change in the cognitions with the uh, androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, but, you know, I cannot talk about the specific uh, for, for, for you uh, about that because there is what we do here, uh, for example, at Muffet and Senior Adult, we have uh, evaluate everything because sometimes there are some reversible cause for cognition and that's not necessarily, it can be corrected. You know, some, for example, change in certain vitamin level, like vitamin B12 or folate, or, or there is maybe something related to thyroid problems. And that's uh, maybe that you didn't have that 20 years ago, but now you have that. So these kind of uh, reversible cause need to be, uh, you know, just look at it and address it first. Definitely when we say cognitive uh, impairment, that, that's a broad term. What kind of cognitive impairment? That's why here kind of we do kind of thorough assessment, which, which types of cognitive impairment. And if we rule out all these causes, and, and this is the last steps to that to kind of, kind of say, okay, this may be treatment related, you know, after we rule out all this, you know, even rule out any organic causes like doing these scans. So, uh, so as I said, like first we need to rule out all these causes, and based on that, if if this androgen like deprivation causing that, we, we we need to know if we can uh, manage this, you know, to do like some management for that uh, types of symptoms. And if we can use different types of therapy, if, if, if we cannot, uh, this is the only options to do. But as I said, we have to start by ruling out all uh, other causes and manage it before kind of uh, blaming the treatment itself. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to take one last question because we are reaching seven o'clock. Um, that last question is, thank you so much for this information, doctors. What is your area? of greatest need. Uh, so maybe we can uh, each one uh, see how we think. I, I would uh, split it into what is the greatest need of research and what is our area of greater need for research money, why not? <laughs> and uh, I, I think uh, my personal uh, focus really now is on digital research. Uh, I think I've tried for 20 years to put patients uh, on clinical trials. And I think clinical trials are very, very important, but there is a group of patients who will never have a clinical trial. I was mentioning my 93 year old patient with prostate cancer and CHF. They're not going to have a trial ever. So I want to do digital research for these patients. I want to be able to give a better treatment to these patients who are not the standard cookie cutter type of patients. And I want to develop results on that. Uh, what would be my need uh, financially right now? I'm trying to develop uh, an infrastructure, a digital aging and cancer infrastructure, where I would have a research staff that learns how to dig in the Muffet database, learn how to interact with the people who do artificial intelligence and who do uh, uh, machine learning research, uh, learn how to what are the best apps for the patient and can advise Muffet researchers on these best apps, uh, be a resource to all of us to do research on aging and cancer. So that's uh, the, my take on my needs. Anna, maybe you want to. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my lab uh, focuses on understanding the biology underneath um, and they need the effects of aging and cancer. So we do basic research that then can inform um, new therapeutic uh, agents that can then be tested in the clinic. So for me, uh, what, what we are really interested in doing is um, because we cannot use uh, people, <laughs> <laughs> we uh, want to uh, give cancers to young and old mice and then use these new technologies that allows us to look at every single cell within uh, the cancer and see how it uh, changes progression and 
um, and uh, therapy efficacy of standard of care therapies that are normally used in the clinic between a young and an old uh, mouse as a surrogate for an individual. So those are, uh, of course, uh, very complex uh, and very costly experiments because they use the latest te technology and they take a very long time because aging is a process that takes a long time. <laughs> uh, and so those are our needs. And we hope that with that, we can really show or, or shed the light into uh, the biological reason as to why we cannot treat old patients just like we treat young patients, which I think is very important. And, and, and it needs to be um, made more uh, clear to at least the research community. I mean, for that, uh, just for me, like I think uh, I'm looking for uh, what kind of research to, to do to reduce the toxicity and improving quality of life of uh, patients uh, during their journey of cancer therapy, which is not only the chemotherapy, we're talking about also about the target therapy, as you mentioned. Uh, we mentioned that there is clinical tools that looking to the individual characteristic, but also, as Dr. Gomez mentioned, there is also biological markers, uh, some related to aging and related to toxicity, so if we conduct a study that uh, implement both or compose both together, maybe we can get uh, certain types of tool that using biological markers with some individual characteristic to better stratify those older adults during, uh, you know, for, for cancer therapy to see who is can I be benefit, who, how can we reduce toxicity. So that's kind of uh, kind of my goal to do more research in that fashion, collaborate with 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 the scientists like Dr. Gomez, uh, just to to get those together, you know, the biological markers and the things. And for that, definitely, it's need a lot of financial support because these tests is most some of them is experimental and need like uh, financial support for that. So I think. Uh, that's a way we can improve uh, quality of life for older adults there during cancer journey because uh, it's right, uh, older adults are different. You have to have different approach for those older adults than young people. Thank you. Now, I said it was the last question, but there is a question that just came in and I think it's a very important one. So I just want to address it briefly. Uh, the question is, are you getting enough minority participants? The short answer is no. <laughs> uh, we certainly don't get enough, uh, as, many, you know, as many as we want. As, as I said, the older patients are the minority, a minority in clinical trials. In, in these breast cancer trials, it's 15% of patients. So you have a 500 patients trial, a uh, hundred, uh, 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 you know, you, you have uh, uh, about 75 of them who are older. And of them, 10% are mini IT patients. Uh, so that's giving seven, seven patients, which is way too little to draw a conclusion. So I think that one of the opportunities of digital aging and cancer is that if we have 600,000 patients, then we can start to have enough minority participants. And then we can start answering some questions. So I really want to also, that's, that's another group where we could really leverage machine learning and artificial intelligences, uh, gather data from enough patients that we can start having some uh, real insight uh, in minority participants. It's a, it's, a, it's a struggle that all cooperative groups have is once you start cutting down the numbers, you end up with small number of people and we, we have to find inventive ways, innovative ways to, to create uh, 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 evidence for, for our minority uh, patients? Uh, I think this is a very important question. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for being with us this hour. Uh, thank you for all the support many of you uh, have given to uh, the Moffitt Foundation and to all of us uh, at, at Moffitt to uh, develop uh, the fantastic research that's being done here. And uh, we really, um, uh, look forward to working with you to improve the outcome of our senior patients. 
Uh, who knows, maybe they can go with Jeff Bezos in space. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I look forward for future uh, discussions with you to keep you posted and, and how things advance in the field. Uh, and uh, I wish you an excellent evening.